we've been talking about social cognition, looking at attribution and looking at uh, attitudes and attitude change. And now we're going to talk about social influence, how other people can affect us. We're going to talk about conformity, compliance, obedience, and bystander apathy, how having other people around can affect their behavior, social influence. The classic experiment on conformity was done by Sharif uh, dealing with the autokinetic effect. The autokinetic effect is if I'm in a dark room and there's a stationary little point of light, so I can't see the surrounding, I can just see the point of light, that even though it's stationary, it will move because their eyes move. We have these saccades that cause their eyes to move around, and that makes the light move around because we don't have the context. If you could see the surround, the light wouldn't move because you see the context of the fact that everything is stationary. So the autokinetic effect is this movement that occurs in this point of light. And what he did was he got a group of people together and he said, okay, tell me how far the light moved in inches. And when you first do that and they report the movement of the light, there's a great individual differences between the movement of the light. But later, as have more and more trials with the, with the point of light, then people's actual judgment will become closer together. In other words, they will conform to each other in producing how much movement of the light actually occurred. And that's what this graph shows. Each line is a different person, and you can see if they're all alone, or if it's on the, but it can't be affected by other people, there are big differences between the judgment of movement. But if, with, if they're with other people, on, and then if there's an, another tri trial like these three people, then even on trial three, the judgment of how much movement occurred has now reached conformity. They will agree on the amount of movement simply by listening to what the others said the amount of movement occurred. So if having other people around produces conformity on this particular task of judging how much movement there was in a light, the autokinetic effect. Uh, the cl another classic experiment in conformity is Ash's study with group, group pressure. And there is a film showing this experiment in the OLI material. It's actually a video. And basically what Ash did was he had people judge the length of lines. So it would show a standard line, and there were many examples of this in different cards. This card, they had a standard line. And then they would judge which of these actually corresponded with the standard line. A, B, or C. And the correct answer, of course, is B, as it should be pretty obvious. But if there were other people in the room, in this case, six Confederates, along with the one true subject, the one participant, the participant always sat in the sixth chair around a table, so Confederate, 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 subject, Confederate. And then when they showed the slide, the people would say C, Second person would say C. Third person would say C, when it's obviously B. What does the Confederate do? Will the Confederate conform with the judgment of other people? Or will they express their true feeling about how long the line was? Well, 76% of the subjects in the experiment gave at least one incorrect answer. About 37% error as if there were six people. And the standard rate of errors was 4%. If there was just one person, you're making the judgments. In all the cards, there was 4% error. But if six people gave uh, the wrong answer, 37% of the time, you would give the wrong answer. You would conform to the judgments of other people. And if there was just one dissenter among those six people that said, even if it was the, uh, the other wrong answer, then your conformity sort of dissipates and you go to 10%. Still above 4%, but greatly under 37%. So the ASH experiment shows us that we don't want to be different from other people. We're not quite sure what's going on here. So I'm going to say the wrong answer, simply conform to the judgment of the people around me. This is a graph just showing that the number of people increases up to about four or five, and then it sort of levels off after that. So it takes about four or five people to produce that group pressure, which produces conformity. 
Now I want to talk about the classic experiment, one of the classic experiments in psychology, the Stanley Milgram experiments on obedience to authority. And actually in the OLI material, Philip Zimbardo actually discusses Milgram's study, and you can hear his views on what occurred in that study. Classic experiments in obedience to authority. What he did was he had people come into a room. There was supposedly two subjects. One was a teacher and one was a learner. And the real subject was the teacher. The learner was a confederate of the experimenter. And he said, okay, I want to have you, have you learn a verbal task. Well, I'm sent words and you have to remember them. And the teacher will do the task. And then the, the learner is actually in, the, in another room from the teacher. And the teacher is told, if the person makes an error, then you have to give them the shock. And you give them an example of one of the low shocks, and it's hardly felt. But the apparatus that's being used, the shocks go up 15 volts from a very mild shock at one end of the array to a very bad shock at the other end, 450 volts. And even has labels on it, so it says things like uh, danger, severe shock, and then my, my favorite is at the other, other end, it just says XXX. And so if the person makes an error, which is a confederate of the experimenter, they give the person a shock. Now the question is, how many people will, and by the way, the experimenter in a white coat is standing there and says, please present the shock, this will cause no permanent tissue damage. Please, you must do this. So the authority figure is standing behind, or sitting behind the teacher, the real subject, telling them they must continue with shocking. If you ask a group, and, and Milgram did this, if you ask a group of psychiatrists, how many people can go all the way to the end, they would say one or two percent of psychopaths. But actually, 65 percent of the subjects went all the way to the 450 volts. Even though there was a tape of the, of the learner, the confederate, and the confederate would say things, stop, this really hurts. Oh, I want to get out of this, I want to stop. The experiment would say, please continue with the experiment. Please present the shock. At the end, there's a, at, at about 300 volts, the person actually screams when the shock is administered in a loud scream, and 65% of the people continue on. And then eventually, towards the end of the scale, the person just stops responding altogether. No responses at all. Since there's no response, treat the no response as an incorrect response and continue with the experiment. 65% went all the way, 450 volts. Even though psychiatrists said only 1% to 2% of psychopaths that would even do that. Now, we say this, this study was done a long time ago. The times were different then. But actually, even though I'm not sure had got through the Institutional Review Board that approves experiments, this was replicated in 2009 by Berger, showing exactly the same effects uh, with this experiment. Obedience to authority uh, explains a lot about why we would do that if there's an authority figure telling us to do it. Now, this experiment has been criticized, and that's why I'm surprised it was replicated, because of the ethics involved with this. What happens to the people who were the teachers? In fact, there's even a, a television show, a, a, a fiction drama, on what happened to these people after participating in this experiment, um, because it surely affected them when they found out that the, the, that the person wasn't getting shocked, even though they went all the way. Most people would predict they would not go all the way. Again, it's, it's the idea of uh, sort of the situation controlling my behavior. But 65% went all the way when Milgram did the experiment and when Berger did the experiment recently. Now I want to switch gears a little bit and say, well, when do people help? When do they actually become altruistic and help people? And the research of Bib Latine and John Darley at Princeton really looked at this effect of bystander apathy. The case was the Kitty Genovese case, which was a case back in the 60s 
where a young woman, 28 years old, working as a manager of a bar, was walking home at 3 o'clock in the morning, and she was brutally attacked outside of her apartment building by a mugger. She was stabbed. She was brutally attacked. The attack lasted 39 minutes as she fought with him. And later it was found that 38 witnesses watched this from their apartments. Lights were turned on. In one case, a couple brought chairs up to the window so they could watch it. But nobody helped. Nobody even called the police. And what Latine and Darley said was, this is diffusion of responsibility. If you're more likely to help if you are alone than if there are other people that could help. Just a few years ago, to the Today Show sort of replicated this by having a gentleman in a, in a confederate, which was a little eight-year-old girl, go up to the girl and grab her and pull her along on a street side. And she would say things like, you're not my daddy, leave me alone. You're not my daddy. And the idea was who would help. And very few people helped. Most people were just walking down the street and they would walk to avoid this couple thinking, well, it must be just a dad and an unruly child. One time when a group of men came up and they saw this, they actually surrounded the guy and started walking <laughs> to get him. He had to say, wait a minute, I'm just on a TV show. She's okay because they were getting ready to take action. So in one case, there was action, but all the rest of the trials, nothing happened. Kitty Genovese case, diffusion of responsibility produces lack of support and help because of this uh, diffusion of responsibility, bystander apathy. They conducted a series of studies to look at bystander apathy experiments, and I want to talk about a few of those now. First, there was the smoke study. You're alone, or you have three other people in the room with you, so there are four, or you have one naive person and two Confederates with you, and you're filling out a questionnaire as a part of the experiment, and all of a sudden white smoke starts coming from the vent in the side of the room. What do you do? Do you help? Well, if you're alone, 75% of the people actually got up and went to the other room to tell the experimenter or tell the person in the other room that smoke was in the room. I worry about that other 25%, but 75% is a pretty good. If there were three naive subjects, only 38% of the time did someone actually report the smoke. Notice that there are three people, so it should be greater than if you were alone, but it's actually greatly reduced by having those other people around. Again, diffusion of responsibility. If you had two Confederates that would not report the smoke, just sat there and fi fi finish the questionnaire, only 10% of the time did anyone report the smoke coming into the room, even when the room was filled with smoke. If you ask them why they didn't report it, nobody said, well, there were other people in the room and they could have done it. No one actually used diffusion of responsibility as an excuse. They would use things like, well, I, th I, I didn't know it was smoke. I thought it was just uh, mist or something coming in from the air conditioning unit. I didn't think there was any danger. In other words, they would report something about the situation, their interpretation of the situation is the reason they didn't go. But actually, it's very clear that the number of people really determines whether or not you report it. Diffusion of responsibility. They did, did another study, the lady in distress study, where you had people come into a room. You were either alone, you were with a friend, so you recruited in pairs of people. You were with a, a confederate who, who's going to be passive the whole time. Or you were with a stranger, another naive subject. And the person would hand out the questionnaires. Then they would go in the other, uh, behind the curtain, turn on a tape recorder where there was this huge crash, like somebody fell down, the table broke. And then there's groaning and moaning and saying, oh, my leg, my leg. Would you help? All you have to do is get up and look around the curtain. Seventy percent of the time, if you're alone, you would help immediately when the, it occurred. If you're with a friend, again, seventy percent of the time, that was help. If there are two people rather than one, you really expect that having two people instead of one, if one is seventy percent, with two it should be ninety-one percent. So there is some inhibition of response here. But if you're with a friend, 
the risk of having inappropriate behavior is less because you're not going to embarrass yourself with a friend, so that produces a higher level. If you're with a passive confederate, only 7% of the time did the person help or at least look to see what was happening. With a stranger, 40%. So again, diffusion of responsibility because you think you're going to do something that's inappropriate, that's the reason. Then there's a stolen beer study where they actually staged a shoplifting, shoplifting incident in a liquor store, and the manipulation was, is there one customer or two customers? And then the shop owner left the room, left, went into the back of the store. The, the criminal took the case of beer and ran out of the store. And then he came back in the store, and immediately 20% of the people, only 20% of the people, reported it spontaneously. You know, somebody just ripped you off and stole that case of beer. If the, exp if the shop owner said things like, well, did something just happen here? What happened to that other guy? Then 51% reported the stolen beer. If you're with a loan, it's 65%. If you're with another person in the store that could have reported it, it drops down to 56%. So again, bystander apathy affected by having someone else that you can diffuse responsibility with. I want to talk about my favorite bystander apathy study, the Good Samaritan study that was done by John Darley and Batson, his colleague. It was done in a seminary, and so the subjects in this experiment were seminary students, students that are studying to be priests and ministers at the seminary, and they were told that they had to go to the building ne next door, um, around the corner, and give a sermon on the Good Samaritan parable. You know the Good Samaritan parable in the Bible. It's where someone is lying on the side of a road, beaten up and disheveled and groaning, and priests and Levites sort of pass by and ignore this, rushing to the, into the city. But a Samaritan, who there were some stereotypes about Samaritans in those times as not being the great kind of people, the Samaritan actually stopped, helped the person, took them to an inn, and paid the innkeeper to take care of this guy until he got well. So they were going to give a sermon on the Good Samaritan parable. The other half were just going to give a talk on jobs for seminary students. So one, one variable is whether they were going to talk about the Good Samaritan parable or not. And the second variable, which proved to be very important, was how much in a hurry they were. In the high rush condition, the person would tell the seminary student, you've got to hurry, they're waiting for you, they're getting ready to film, get out of here, go do it. Um, so they're highly rushed, they're very hurried, and it was an intermediate rush. The thing really has to be done today, so I'd go over there and, and have it done. They can't wait until tomorrow. And then it was a low rush, content. No, no hurry, just take your time, and but we want you to go do that. So the variable was really how much were they in a hurry. Now, the finding, they had 40 participants, and of the 40 seminary students, only 16 offered help. Only 40% actually offered some help to the individual. The big variable was the rush, though. If they're in a high rush condition, only 10% stopped to um, help the person. If there's intermediate rush, 45%. And if it's low rush, no hurry, they'll do it whenever you get there, 63% offered to help. In the high rush condition, one of the seminary students actually had to step over the gentleman groaning on the ground to see if that door would let them into the building. When it wouldn't, they stepped back over the guy and went around the side of the building. So they point out that maybe the parable of the Good Samaritan is that the Levite and the priest were very, very busy. They were very rushed. They had part of the things to do in the city. The seminarian, excuse me, the, the Samaritan was not in a hurry and had the, could stop in help the individual. So maybe the rush and in how involved we are with what we have to do next is an important thing in determining when someone helps. By the way, if they're going to give a talk on jobs, 29% helped. And if they're going to get a sermon on the Good Samaritan parable, 53% helped. But that means 47% did not, even though they're going to talk about that very thing in their sermon. So bystander apathy, according to 
Latin A and Darley is that you first have to note, you have to sort of notice that there's an emergency. And if you don't notice it, you're not going to help. You have to interpret it as an emergency. If you don't think it's an emergency, you're not going to help. You have to accept responsibility. And if there are other people around, you're less likely to accept responsibility, so you're not going to help. Then you have to say, well, the behavior I'm going to engage in, is it appropriate? In other words, is, is it appropriate for me to help, given that I'm not a medical, I don't have any medical knowledge? If you say no, then you're not going to help. And if you say yes, then you will help. So all of these stages are important in determining whether or not you're going to help in an emergency. This graph, by the way, is in the OLI material. Thank you.